You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Hi, and welcome. Um, huge crowd. I'm very happy to uh, have the possibility to talk to you. One idea to rule them all that will be the question uh, throughout the talk. Um, first, uh, Austrian State Printing House or Österreichische Staatsdruckerei. That's probably what you think about if you hear that word. Uh, passports. We do passports, driving licenses, uh, ID documents, um, everything that's high security documents um, for the real world right now. Maybe you even think of us uh, in terms of something like this, a little bit uh, dusted old company um, with uh, steampunk optics. And that's true, because we still do all these old documents like passports, because probably everybody of you has some ID document in some form uh, uh, with you right now. But uh, things change, and we're a 210 years plus old company, and 10 years ago, we changed the company to personalization, so we do no longer only print passport booklets, but we imprint all your personal data into these documents. Right here, that's a driving license, uh, like the uh, moderator just, just showed us, uh, that's being uh, personalized within our properties. So we put about 2 million personal data sets, so the most high value uh, data sets of your personal identities on documents within our premises. And one of the most important steps within this personalization is that we delete all your data after using it in a secure way. And we changed again about five years ago, so that's not a stock photo somewhere taken. Um, that's probably one of your uh, working spaces. And that's within OSD too. So we're a 210 years plus company um, that now, well, I would guess the last 10 persons I hired are programmers. Coders. And that's one of our first results that we are very proud of. That's the first worldwide, first EID and ID document solution in one piece that's highly secure and it's user centered built. We did not want to build any ID uh, document for the new world that's not user centered. So it's very easy to use. It's always the same three step process to show your ID either in real world or in the internet. But I don't want to bore you with things uh, that are already on YouTube. You can watch our presentations from one and a half year ago. You can watch our demo videos um, online. I want to demonstrate to you what we like to think and what we like to think about, and that's bigger. Um, we like to think about exponential technologies. And if you want to have, uh, well, the, the most perfect presentation and idea of what exponential technologies are about, you have to go to Singularity University in California, um, of course in Silicon Valley. Um, if you get any chance uh, to see any of their um, sessions, please do so. So what's it all about? Um, well, a linear function, an exponential function, everybody of you knows that the big thing is about the difference here in the end. But before we get there, there are two different zones. Exponential technologies very often start with uh, disappointment. It's almost like 3D printing. 3D printing has been around for years, and everybody talked about it, and we will all print our coffee cups or something at home. It came to a big amount of life in uh, industry, but not at home yet. So for many people, that's still a disappointment. But that's deceptive, because these technologies come up with a lot of speed, and if you prepare in the right moment, you will, in the end, have an opportunity, you will have amazement. If you calculate with that what, what our brain is used to, if you think linear, you will just uh, be in chaos when other people are up here on the curve. And that's only the beginning of the curve. And that's here, down here. What we really talk about in exponentials is the 10x, 100x, 1000x factor. And that's what we like to think about. And that's how we plan the future of OSD to plan the future of a company that's 210 years old, and we want to get to 300 at least. Moore's Law, I don't have to tell anybody in this room what this is. Um, there has been a lot of rumors about Moore's Law um, stopping and not being valid anymore. Well, if you look at that curve, well, that's a logarithmic scale, so that linear thing would be an exponential curve. It's still working. In fact, it's even speeding up 
in some moments. There are some other exponential thoughts I want to give you. Um, you have here a diagram with um, calculations per second in a 1,000 bucks computer. So basically a smartphone right now, more expensive smartphone. Over the years, and in year 2000, and there are new figures that comply with that curve going on here, we had the computing power of an insect in our pocket. And we will come to, well, look here, 2020, we will have the calculation power of one human brain in our pockets by 2020, probably. And we will have the power of all human brains in our pocket for 1,000 bucks in 2040. That's tremendous, and that's what we have to think about. Not calculating in any linear development. It's going faster and faster and faster, and it's speeding up every time we look at it. If you have time to read something, read something from Ray Kurzweil, uh, you might know him especially as the Google Director of uh, Engineering. Um, he wrote a lot of the books and also was a co-creator of Singularity University. So if you get any time to read something like this about artificial intelligence and how to create a mind, uh, that's really a tremendous thought and that's what we should be, should be thinking about. So in OSD, we like to think not only about, well, how do we bring a company to the internet or something like that. We want to go further, much further in our, our thoughts. So, what will identities be like if we talk about artificial superintelligence, about radical life extension matters? That's the question we have to talk about. Think bigger. And in so many areas, artificial intelligence and robotics, biotechnology and bioinformatics, energy and environment, mental systems, and I will talk about that uh, in a moment. Design is so important to everything, and I uh, see mo so many guys with beautiful devices, uh, whether they are from Apple or Samsung, devices get the design now, and it's not only about device design, but of course uh, user interfaces, nanotechnology, that's something, because here's a very silicon-based crowd probably, um, but uh, that, that relies on, uh, has a relation to, to nanotechnology, but especially to biotechnology and medicine and neuroscience, most people that are focused on silicon do not get what's moving there and what's going on there, but that's, these are areas uh, we have to think of. Also, of course, finance and economics. And last but not least, our organizations have to follow these structures and to um, inherit the ideas of exponential technologies to cope with the speed everything develops. And that's very interesting. It's even more interesting for governments because they are currently the slowest moving part. Now I would like to talk about energy and environment and just get with me in this um, experience. Uh, just open your head for a moment and think about, well, one of the most important things we have and that are, ve that are very um, scarce, it's energy. Energy is expensive, very expensive right now. Um, and everything's regulated by oil. Our politics, our life has been regulated in big parts by oil and the availability of oil. Whereas we have the sun out there, but the sun is expensive and it's so hard to get there, that energy. Well, guess what? That's changing and it's changing on an exponential scale. And there's an exponential scale going down. That's the price of solar energy. Solar energy was in the last summer for the first time on the same price level to get one kilowatt hour um, of energy out of oil was the same price as getting it out of solar panels. So that's dropping rapidly. And at the same time, the efficiency of the solar panels is exponentially moving up. So think about that. 10 seconds of sunlight. All the sunlight that comes onto Earth would be sufficient for the energy demand of humanity for a whole day in 10 seconds. If you multiply that, in one hour, we would have all the energy we need for all of humanity in the current stage for one year. Okay, but we cannot cover all the Earth with uh, solar panels. Okay. Um, guess what? There are calculations for that also. You would only need 0.3% of the world's surface with current technology, not with the technology that we will have in 10 years. And you see these little dots here on the landmarks, most of them in deserted areas or really in deserts. Um, that would be enough to have energy for the whole Earth, for all of humanity. And that's what it looks like then. It's big, big, big solar farms 
solar panels. So you might get to a point in time where energy is free, almost free, almost everywhere, and always. Think of that. All the structures that all built, political structures, uh, infrastructures, gone, completely gone. So if we build on that, take that head experiment, experiment with me. If energy is free, almost free, available in vast amounts, we can focus on another problem, on water, because water is also very rare on, on the Earth, at least in a drinkable form. We have a lot of water in the sea, but it's uh, salt water. Desalination is very energy intensive, but if we have enough energy, we can do water. We can make water everywhere we want, everywhere we have uh, some salt water. If we have water and we have soil and we have energy, you can do food. And that sounds so, well, fantastic and um, not too realistic. But that's actually a farm in the middle of nowhere, in the south of Australia. There was nothing, nothing around every, anywhere. Just the sea in the background. And guess what? They're desalinating the water. That's drinkable water. And they're building a big, big farm out there. Of course, they need a lot of energy. So they built their own solar plant. Very big solar plant. Um, and you see in the background the sea over there. So it has to be close to the sea, of course. And that's the combination we do. You go to in the middle of nowhere, soil is almost for free. Your energy is for free if you build the plant. You take the water from the sea, you desalinate, and you build a greenhouse. And out of the middle of nowhere, you have a plant for tomatoes. Just right out of nothing. Of course, you have to deliver. So these ideas that are, uh, are not that crazy, it's already working. People are doing that. Exponential technology is so important. Open your heads to these things. And uh, if you have any chance uh, to watch the things, um, please do so. Closer to the topic of, of, of my company, of ID, biometrics. Biometrics is the key to ID in the future. So I just want to walk through with you of some of these technologies that also are, each and every one of them is on an exponential track. Of course, the first thing you think about is uh, fingerprints. Everybody knows what it is, how it works. You have it in your smartphones. I have it in my smartphone. We get, get used to these uh, fingerprints very fast. If you think back just a second, about um, 10, 12 years from now, that was the time when we had to put the fingerprints into a chip that's in the passport. Because it was uh, in the EU regulation and basically some development after 9-11. The first thoughts were nobody will do it because everybody thinks they are criminals if they have to give their fingerprints in the local authorities. And there was a real concern for everybody. How do we convince people to give the fingerprints when they apply for a passport? But it turned out not to be a problem. So often, it's uh, the matter with biometrics that everybody thinks everybody's scared and nobody will do it. In fact, it was really not a problem. It was not a discussion. And that because it was not only, but also because it was very good prepared. The system of the usage of fingerprints in the passport is a very special system and it's very focused on one purpose only, identifying one person to one passport. So it's one to one. Um, and not one to n, like you see it in uh, CSI or something, when they find one tenth of a fingerprint and they uh, get out a question to a database with uh, 10 million uh, people in there and they get back only one result, not working anywhere. But fingerprints are very important, and they are getting into our smartphones in a rapid, rapid way. And right now, more than 60%, uh, I believe, in Austria of the smartphones already have fingerprint sensors. And we want to make use of them, and we have to make use of them to get uh, identity securely to the smartphone. And we have it in the passport, I told you. Um, but we cannot ever use these fingerprints, because these fingerprints that are taken from your two index fingers in the local authorities in Austria 
um, are destroyed after we put them into the document. So there is no fingerprint database for, from passport appliers in Austria, at least. Other biometrics, vein, vein diagrams. Um, that's a try with a smartphone just to see it with, with, the, with the light of the smartphone. In the most cases, you have to use uh, bigger devices, and uh, it's kind of intrusive because you really have to put your hand somewhere, and, and, and it's low in that way. But it's very secure in the moment, and it's very hard to fake. Facial recognition, all of you know, hardly depending on 3D detection, live detection, etc. Um, probably only in combination with some other biometric features useful for high security. Some not so much known biometrics, that's nose biometrics. So you capture uh, the form of the nose. And of course, of the nose, you have to do the ear. That's possible, too. Um, that you can do mostly with a camera. Voice recognition. Well, that was, uh, it's so easy to use. And we have microphones in all smartphones, so that would be a really good technology. Big problem with the last presentations of Adobe, where they can, they can with the last product, I just don't remember the product name right now, um, they can rebuild your voice only after a few words um, of recording. So basically, um, voice recognition, especially voice recognition only, is not um, any good for high security documents. Iris scan. Well, that was uh, patented for a long time, so nobody used it really because they would have to have would have to pay license fees. Problem with Iris also, you can see a lot of. Um, you can uh, find more things than only identity within the eye. And that's a problem uh, with privacy. Big area, and I think one of the most important areas right now is uh, behavioral. Um, that's a picture of a website of, of BehaviorZac. Um, that's the future possibly to go for a big part of secure identity and uh, of the new ways of, of uh, identity not being identified at one single point in time, but on continuous identification. Brain waves, yeah. You've probably all seen the YouTube videos where you can, with a brain wave, direct a car or direct uh, some, some basic computer functions. These functions can also be used to identify yourself. That's quite unusual. That's some kind of aura identification. Basically, it's microbial clouds around you that you could sensor. Also a good idea. Um, actually, that's really a Microsoft project. That's a bra ID. Um, and where are we going to? It's not uh, once or one biometric only. It's multimodal. It has to be multimodal. So combination of different um, biometrics. Basically, it's uh, like behavioral always in there and then adding up um, whatever sensors you have available, especially on your smartphone. Because if you add up you get a lot better results um, on false acceptance rates, especially. Second trend is multimodal and continuous authentication. Uh, I don't know if you heard of uh, Google Abacus. Um, they are way ahead of a lot of their competitors right now. And that's a big change that's going to happen. Right now, identification is matters in one point in time. You get identified by entering your password. You get identified at the border gate. You get identified um, by the police if they stop you and ask for your driver's license. In this system, you get identified and authenticated continuously over time. So you see, you have a trust score that's high if you browse, because it captures your browsing um, behaviors, basically. How you move your fingers, how you tilt the phone, how you vibrate the phone. And if somebody else browses, his, his uh, browsing features are completely different. So the trust score goes down. If you take up your phone yourself, it identifies you again, and it's continuous authentication. Very important if you talk about biometrics. So if you want to, want to work in biometrics, and especially in identity, um, you should get probably familiar with the FIDO lines. Big, big alliance, a lot of internet alliances died after one year. This alliance is now up for third or fourth year. Very big, we have been a member of, uh, from the first year on. They are doing something like standardization for biometrics. Well, is the one ID to rule them all? For sure, it's not the passport. But it may be 
the data behind the passport and the data in the database that we use to produce the passport if it's state-driven identity. But the passports definitely won't work in our virtual worlds that we will have in 10 or 15 years in usage uh, probably every day. So state-issued identities vers versus um, self-sovereign identity. That's a big topic right now. And in Europe, it's quite clear because state-issued identities are very important. And that's the usual thing to do, at least in the center of Europe. It's completely different if you look, for example, for Australia. In Australia, you can prove your identity by showing three bills, paid bills, like water bill, gas bill, um, and your rent bill. And that identifies your person over there. ID is a big business topic. Um, just three days ago, Deutsche Bank, Allianz, and Daimler in Germany announced that they will build, <laughs> that's kind of ironic, um, a platform for IDs against the platform business of Facebook and Google. Um, so they want to build something that combines IDs, um, also in, in, in combination with EIDAS regulation, um, to have something to oppose Facebook and Google. I think that's a very hard thing to do, especially for companies that have really no skin in the game right now. Which form factors will IDs have in 10 years plus? Um, I think there will be no smartphone. I think it will be without a form factor. There will be non-factor. I think it will be ubiquitous sensors everywhere and a big AI system in the background that continuously identifies yourself and some kind of personal system that runs with you everywhere and identifies you to the system you approach. I think that's doable, and it's doable within 10 years. And that's what we have to prepare for. So if you think of it, we're a 210 years plus old company that is still printing with the old steampunk machines you see. And basically, we know in 10 years, we will still have the passport to cross borders, because crossing a border is the most difficult thing um, to get standardization done worldwide. But you guys here and most of the people out there that are younger and that are more affinitive to, to, to the internet, they will use different things. For me, sec secure identity is a key issue for individuals, society, business, and politics. We take it so for granted right now because it's so basic and it works. Your passport, your driver's license, your ID, it works. Well, in the last year and the political developments in the last year, we found out it's not so secure as we think in some, in some countries. In Austria, we have a very strong ID security system. But that's not the matter, even not all for all European countries. Um, and it's really a function um, for freedom and for thriving the economy. Because if we would have some electronic ID, you, everybody of you could use in your codes that you could rely on that would be universal, uh, also at least in Europe or maybe worldwide at some point in time, um, it would be much easier for you to build high security systems, um, whether if that's in fintech or in any other area. We built something like that. We call it Mia. It's the My Identity app. Um, if you're interested, we put it on YouTube. We put the presentation on YouTube. Um, and if you're interested in working in that area, please uh, contact me or co contact our company. We're continuously shopping for talent, and we need the best of you. Thank you. Lucas, thank you very much for your talk. Um, when we talk about personal identification, people are always scared about security. Yeah. So some people here are keen to learn about your strategies to make your application secure. Because that's the biggest concern for many of them. Yeah. Maybe it will change. It, but it, it's a concern for us, of, uh, of course, too. Because um, uh, Austrian State Painting House has earned a lot of trust over time. And that's the, the, uh, it's a very powerful instrument. And we, we don't want to lose anything of that. So of course, security was at the top level of our priorities when building these apps. And one of the 
difficult decisions we made was that we did not want to put our security in hardware anymore. For centuries, we put uh, security in hardware, so in secure elements or something like that, that are just not available where the user is. And that's a big problem. So we put our security in the processes and how we design these processes extremely careful, um, but not in hardware. Thank you. That leads to the question, I mean, people are thinking nowadays that open source is much safer than closed source because it's reviewed by many, many people. What's your strategy on that? Is everything closed or do you open source parts or how do you deal with that? Yeah. Um, right now, because we have uh, not deployed MIA in any country, um, it's a closed system. But um, <laughs> it's difficult because our clients, usually they are the governments. They are not used to put anything okay. in open source. Um, but we talk to them <laughs> and we very often suggest, please put these parts online and you don't have to put everything online, but this, the important parts, put these out there so everybody can check it, so everybody can learn from, from the crowd and we can take, uh, get a more secure system much faster. Thank you. One last question. I'm personally very interested into the blockchain. You know, Sorry? Into the blockchain, okay. Bitcoin, Ethereum. Yeah. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? How will it impact that personal identification? Yeah. There are projects out like Microsoft Uport, which connect your ID, your person, with the blockchain. Yeah. I think it's uh, a very important piece, piece of technology. I think it's also at the same time overhyped in many, many areas. So um, <laughs> we made the experience if we put uh, research papers or uh, applications for conferences out. If we don't have the word blockchain anywhere in it, you just get not elected to, to, to anything. Um, blockchain is very important and we, look, we will possibly have a blockchain feature with a, with a new passport generation, the next one. Um, I think it's a big topic, in, especially with uh, self-governed and, and uh, self-issued identities, yeah. um, but it's not the solution to everything. Thank you, Lucas. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Uh, big applause for Lucas. Thank you very much. <laughs>